Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to this week's episode of a Prep School Roundtable. And we've got three special guests today joining us. And what we're going to do today is just talk about the current trends in the prep school world. Uh, and it's April 2024 right now. A lot of moving and shaking is going on. There's a lot of uh, conversations that we've all heard over the past few weeks of March Madness. And we want to share this with you from my perspective and from these three coaching perspectives so you guys get a better uh, update on where the prep school world is at right now. I'm Corey Heights. I'm the founder and CEO of Prep Athletics. I help prep school players connect with the right fitting prep school and I've worked with all these guys before. Um, we've also got John Zoll from Vermont Academy here, Lamar Reddix from Milton Academy. We've got Trey Morn from Phelps School. And we're quickly going to go around right now and have each coach introduce himself and tell them a little bit about themselves and their school. And then we'll start getting in the questions. So, John, if you want to lead us off, why don't you get started? How are you? Um, I'm John Zoll from Vermont Academy. Um, we're a small independent boarding school located in Southern Vermont, uh, right on the New Hampshire border. Uh, we've been around for almost 150 years, small school, about 220 kids, um, nice intimate environment, great community. Um, basketball wise, we're in the NEPSAC. We compete in NEPSAC class AAA. Um, NEPSAC AAA is, is really neat because we play college games here. Um, so, you know, we're playing 40 minute games, the NCAA three point line, 30 second shot clock, the restricted arc, just like the games you, you'd watch on, on TV during March Madness. Um, so it's great preparation for our guys, um, you know, as they, they head off to, to school. Thanks, John. How about you, Lamar? My name is Lamar Riggs. I'm the director of athletics and also the basketball coach at Milton Academy. This is my 16th year um, as the basketball coach, 13th year in the role as athletic director. Um, I actually grew up in the town of Milton. I wasn't smart enough to go to a school like this, but I, uh, I was very familiar with uh, Milton Academy as a young lad. Um, you know, we participate in NEPSAC basketball as well. We participate in Class A. Um, a lot of high academic schools are in Class A, uh, and our school will be considered to be in, in that same category as a, a highly academic uh, institution as well. Thanks, Lamar. Trey? Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Trey Moore, and I'm the head basketball coach and athletic director at the Phelps School. Uh, we are located in Malvern, PA, about 25 miles west of the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we compete in PESA, which is the Pennsylvania version of the NEPSAC. We're not divided into classes. It's kind of a group of about 50 independent schools um, that are kind of similar to each other. Uh, we're very small. We're about 90 students, all boys, uh, with a heavy focus on athletics. Our two kind of main focuses right now are our basketball, obviously, and then we have a, a pretty well-rounded and strong soccer program um, that competes kind of, you know, throughout New England and, and really nationally. So I'm excited to be here with you guys. Hopefully, uh, you know, this will be valuable for some folks. Yeah, and we're going to give credit to Trey for actually starting this during COVID. So we're picking this up years later. Uh, Trey in the past has brought on different coaches from different areas and different types of schools to give their perspective. So now in April, 2024, we're, we're picking it back up again. And Trey, we're going to start with you. we got a couple questions here uh, to ask the coaches to get their feedback on what their thoughts are. And if you've got any questions you want us to answer at the end, go ahead and chat it, chat it out there in the chat box on zoom. And if we have time, we'll get to those and, and make sure we answer your questions. If any questions come up, we do not get to um, during this time, feel free to reach out to me, uh, Corey Heights at gmail.com. That's too much for you, Corey, C-O-R-Y, at prepathletics.com. And prepathletics.com is a website that's got a lot of resources. It's going to touch on a lot of these questions we're going to ask tonight, too. Um, so here to help if possible. Trey, we're going to start with you. Um, and then we'll go to Lamar and John. It's April 2024, currently right now. And why do you think that prep school is an even more important option now for players than maybe it's been in the past? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, obviously a really kind of hot topic right now. I think the easy answer to that is colleges are trending older, um, which lends itself to both repeat students and postgrad students. Uh, you know, so as they trend older, you also are going to need an advocate in this world. I think all, you know, uh, all of 
us up here have a number of colleges that we can call and not only are you going to pick up the phone, they're going to value our opinion. Um, we're all a stop on the road, so to speak. So, you know, whether we have a player they're currently recruiting or not, you know, Vermont, Milton Phelps are stops along the road. So in order to be recruited by a college, you have to be seen by a college. And I think that ultimately what these places offer is just that, right? The, the inability to hide behind the lack of exposure because, you know, we've had 250 schools in our gym this year. Um, so our kids get recruited because of that. Love it. Lamar, what about you? What are you thinking? Uh, to pick up where Trey left off, I think the exposure is unmatched. Um, you know, I think, you know, like you said, you know, we had probably about 200, you know, college coaches come and see us play. Um, you know, we're sending kids off to the highest level. We have a kid going to Purdue who was in the national championship game, a kid going to Boston College, two kids going to the Ivy League, Harvard and Princeton. We have a kid that just played at North Carolina, finishing up at, at UNC, and a kid that played at um, Yale this past year. So the exposure is is second to none, um, for sure. But also, like Trey said, too, is, is that, you know, colleges are trending to older players. Um, just look at the portal. They're, you know, they're taking more kids out of the portal than they are, you know, kids coming straight out of high school. Um, so the game has changed. And I actually think, you know, having been doing this for 16 years at this level and eight at the college level, I worked at Harvard and BU before taking over this job here. Um, what you see for sure is that, um, you know, these kids are growing into their bodies at certain times and getting stronger. Um, and you hope that, you know, college coaches are playing guys who are bigger, stronger, faster. And so, um, you know, you going to a school and sitting on the bench, that's just not what most kids want to do nowadays. They want an opportunity to be able to play. And this gives you a better chance to be able to walk and have an opportunity to try to play right away because you're, you would have, you hopefully have grown, grown into your body a little bit. Yeah. How about you, John? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think right now kind of, in, in, this year in the immediate future there's you know you, you're looking at a lot of these kids who have their COVID year still and this is this is the last year that they still have their COVID year so you know you're looking at kid going from 2024 to 2025 that's huge in terms of opportunities for scholarships you know the, the following year so you know this is a big class that you want to jump from from you know one year to the next um, but then I think just overall like um, you know, the other coaches mentioned that extra year is just huge, right? You know, now you're playing your senior year of college at potentially 23 or 24 instead of 22 or 23. And um, you get another year to to get stronger. You're hopefully going into your freshman year um, a little bit more ready to compete. Um, and the thing, you know, I talk about too with, with, with our guys is, you know, all of us, I think, do a really good job of, of having our programs travel and playing in a lot of, um, events where there's multiple teams and obviously coaches populate those events but you know we also you know we played 37 games this year and they're all on film so I tell our guys all the time that you know hey just because you know you have a you have a great game and it's you know we're up at Bridgeton and maybe a college coach isn't there we have that film and a college coach understands the level that we're playing at they understand that the other, you know, 10 kids in the other team getting in the game are all college players at some level. Um, so I think that 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 helps a lot. You know, if a kid has a good game, a kid plays well at our level, they understand, you know, what that means and who they're competing against and how that would, you know, then translate to college. Absolutely. And on top of that, for non-basketball purposes, prep schools do prepare kids for other things as well, right? Like getting your homesickness out of your system, uh, learning how to do things on your own, such as turning in homework without mom or dad breathing down your neck, getting up on your own for a 530 workout, learning how to do your laundry, learning how to make a sandwich if you've never done that before. Some some kids have done all this stuff. Some kids have not. So just these basic life skills on top of the basketball and the academics you'll get. So when you get to a college campus and all your freshman classmates and teammates are kind of freaking out, being away from mom and dad or their girlfriend, you can hit the ground running because you've done this for at least a year and you're more prepared right? Prep school for college. And you would have been coming straight out of mom and dad's house in high school. So you get that on top of the basketball as well. Right. Um, thanks for answering that guys. Lamar, let's get you next on this one. Um, 
Talk to me about how working with a prep school coach like you, and this goes for you guys as well, how do you help your players get placed in college? We, we talked a little bit about the exposure, which is, like I said, really, really important. But the second, the other part to it, too, is the connections that we all have to college coaches, coaches and the access that we have to college coaches. Um, I think Trey mentioned it, um, briefly when he was talking before is that I can pick up the phone and call almost any coach and I know someone on the staff, you know, and they know also that if I'm saying that this kid can play at that level, that there's a trust that that kid can play at that level. I wouldn't be calling them wasting their time. Um, a lot of my is, is personal experience from being a college coach and knowing a lot of these guys. Um, but I also work a lot of camps uh, in the summertime with other, you know, college coaches. Um, so that those relationships that we have are really, really helpful in those situations. How about you, John? Yeah, I mean, I think just to piggyback off off what Lamar said, you know, I think the relationships that coaches have with with our level is extremely valuable. Um, you know, they understand what a kid goes through throughout a year here, and especially kids who are playing multiple years at this level. Um, you know, they're aware of of kind of the the rigors, you know, athletically, academically, like you were saying earlier, living away from home. Um, and they understand, you know, what, it, you know, all the players that this level has produced, you know, not just, of course, you know, you watch and you see the kids at the highest level and everyone talks about those kids, but all the way down to low major division two, great division three players and on and on. So, you know, I, th I just think the track record speaks for itself and college coaches know that, you know, Hey, th this is, this is a place to find good players, right. You know, our guys and in, in our programs, are very similar, you know, there's college players up and down the roster, you know, we, we had 14, probably 14 kids in our roster this year that'll play college basketball somewhere. And that's, that's who they're working out with 250 days a year. Um, so it's a great environment to raise a basketball player as well. It's a great environment to get better. Um, and, you know, and it prepares you and, and the coaches know that. Ray, how about yourself? Yeah. I mean, uh, just to kind of add really to what they say, I think the relationships are big. I think, um, you know, we all kind of have our niche of where we try to get kids and, and not only to come to our schools, but also place. And I think all of that wraps into the intentionality that we're able to, to deal with, right? Like we get to know a student, we get to know, okay, this kid fits, you know, X NESCAC versus Y NESCAC. And here's why we know their rosters or X IV versus Y IV. And here's why. Um, because of those relationships, not only that we have with the schools, but the intentionality that we can, um, you know, get to know the students with, I think is also really important because as they're multiple year kids, as they're, you know, on our campus and then our, in our ecosystem, I think we, we can just be a little bit more hands-on with their recruitment, um, especially the earlier we get them, the more we can kind of craft that recruitment towards what that family is looking for. And Trey, let's go back to this now. Let's talk about fit, right? We, My big thing is finding the right fit for kids, the right prep school for them. But you guys take the burden of the responsibility of finding the right fit for the kids at the college level. And something we probably hear from 80% of the kids we all talk to is, I want to play D1. So when you have your initial phone call with the family and they tell you their goals, how do you fit in not crushing their dreams, but also the reality of trying to find the right fit for them? Yeah, I mean, I think that to me is the biggest hurdle of the job, right? Because I don't ever want to tell a student like you can't do this because we've had plenty of kids. I mean, I, there's one on our roster now that have never talked to a college coach and they're about to sign a Division One scholarship, right? And I didn't know if they were a Division One player, thought he had a chance. You know, I say you come in and you work hard and all these things like the, the, the lack of exposure is not going to be the issue, right? But here are, you know, some marking points versus the film that we've seen that I think can help you get there. Right. But then the fit comes in with, well, you know, I'm a 4-0, 15-50 kid and, you know, I want an academic experience. It's very specific. That's where that the kind of fit comes in. Right. Um, and we also have students that come and they want to be Division One walk-ons. And that's a very different recruitment process than that of, you know, we're pushing for any scholarship that we can get. So um everybody's fit is different everybody's opinion of what their right fit is is different we try to kind of meet the families at a happy medium and so far we've been really successful Lamar 
So I, uh, so I think fit is really important, and, and I talked about this very at the very beginning. Is that you know Milton's a high academic school, so we're going to matriculate most of our kids to high academic schools, and that's what they're looking for when they come here. You know, and before working here, like I said, I worked at Harvard, BU, and here, and I argue that I've never been smarter than the kids that I've coached at any institution that I've worked at, which is real. Um, but, you know, we have the kids, we have three kids in the Ivy League right now. We have, um, you know, a kid going to Richmond. We have a kid at Amherst. Uh, we have a kid, you know, so we, we matriculate some of our kids to some of the top academic schools across the country. Um, and, you know, you know, one of, you know, Cormac Ryan, who was just at UNC, started off at Stanford, you know, so, um, and a um, kid that's at Yale, he started off at Northwestern. And so, you know, I'm naming some of the top academic institutions across the board. So the typical Milton kid is coming here and hopefully to be flipped off to another school, a high academic school as well. But with that, within that, you've got your Yale's Northwestern's all the way down to your D3s. Like, talk to me how, do you have this conversation the first time you talk with them, Lamar, to make sure their expectations are set? Or how do you deal with this when a kid's got D1 dreams and he might not be a D1 player yet. So I, I think my biggest thing that I sell to kids is that your goal is to be a college basketball player because I don't think you realize how hard that is in itself. Um, and we typically, throughout the course of a year, we try to get to a Division three game and we try to get to a Division one game. And I like to have them see the level and how good some of these Division three schools are just in our area right here, you know. Um, so it's a it's a good reminder for them that they see the bodies of some of these Division three kids and um, and we and right before we just talked about this we you know we talked about Division two where I played as well it's like your goal is to be a college basketball player because that's going to be a hard enough goal as it is and so the level will figure itself out like it always does um, but your goal is to be able to say you're a, a college basketball player because that's a that's a hard enough task in itself right now. Got it, John. I mean, I, I think the most important thing in, in that I think about this is, is that, you know, I, I just want all of our guys to go to school and, you know, have a great experience, right? And, and most of that comes from finding the right fit, right? Kids who go a level too high and have to switch schools twice or go a level too high and don't play, um, those kids typically don't enjoy their experience, right? So I, I always try to, when I'm having conversations with them and their families and, and, and you know, helping them with their recruitment, I, I always am trying to think about, will this kid have a great experience there? Um, and I know right now, you know, the the, the landscape in Division One is is challenging, right? It's not only challenging to find a spot, but also when you find a spot, it's challenging, right? I mean, some of these programs are adding eight new kids every year and their coach, you know, is he going to get fired this year or next year or who knows or assistants bouncing around. So it's, there's a lot to, to take into account when you're helping a kid pick a school. And, um, you know, I always tell our guys, you know, I don't care what level it is. I care good program, bad program, and there's good programs and bad programs at every level. And I just try my hardest to, to make sure that they're going to good programs with, with good coaching staffs and good cultures. And, you know, those are the kids that usually will find success and have good experiences. John, how much, how much do you suggest a school to a kid? Like if he's got three schools he's talking to, and you know, the one that you think is the right fit for him, how much do you suggest that? Or how much do you let him just figure it out and make the decision on their own? Those are not my decisions. I stay out of those conversations. You know, I give my I give my thoughts on all of them, but I more so just point them towards facts, right? Point them towards facts, whether it be winning, whether it be player retention, whether it be longevity of a coach, whether it be, you know, ex, you know, kids experiences, wh whatever it may be, it could be a location, it could be a you know, maybe a kid doesn't want to go far from home. And I remind them, well, you know, this school is far from your home, you know, so whatever you're trying to get, you know, you're usually just trying to surround them with facts, but I stay away from those decisions. It's, it's them. And then it's their parents. And, um, you know, I'm fortunate that I have really good kids and really good parents and, and they usually make the right decision. And, you know, that's, that's a big part of it too. So. Lamar, how do you handle that? If a kid's down to three schools and ask your advice, what, how do you impart your information on that? 
it's very similar to to John. Like you know, we sit down and talk about the factors that you know, what they're looking, looking for, right? Are you looking to be on a college campus? Are you looking to be in the city? Are you looking to be away from home? Are you looking to be close to home? What are the things that are important to you in making this decision? Um, and then, you know, he just talked about it too. Like, all right, well, you know, will that coach be there for your four years? Are you, will you be there for four years? Or, or is it, are you going to be shopping around for a new school in a year or so? Like, you know, so I think all those, there's a bunch of contributing factors now. Um, but I think, you know, really at, at the forefront, you know, we, we always start with a list as to what is it that you're looking for? What are you trying to get out of this experience? And, and do you want to be close to home? Do you want to be far away? All those, those factors are really important. So you do that initially, like a kid signs with Milton. Do you have that conversation with them to kind of know which schools you want to reach out to during the course of their recruitment or when does so that one, once they enter their junior year, I start asking them, they, they give me a list of schools that you're interested in. And then we go, well, why are you interested in, in these schools? And, and maybe it's the location, maybe it's the academic reputation. Maybe it's, uh, you know, I know this coach or uh, I had a friend that went to school here and really liked it, whatever those, those, those factors are, but we got to feel like we got to get to the point of what's going to be really important to you. Is it important for your parents to see every single one of your games live and that they can be able to drive to it? Well, that's that we need to figure that out. Um, is it, are you, do you really want to get away and just be out of this new England area? That's different. And, um, and, and we get all of that. You know, we have a kid that's at Colorado college and he, really had all the NESCACs, um, you know, taking a look at them, but he really wanted to get away from this area and which was pretty unique. And, and he loves his experience there. So um, when we were able to find a, a, a great fit for him. Great. How about you, Trey? Yeah. I mean, I think um, helping students with their college decision, I think is, a, is, has been great for me. I think it's been one of the most rewarding things, but like these guys said, I think the first thing that, the student has to figure out is what did they want and what do they want their experience to be. And sometimes that can be difficult. So we I actually do this with uh, my program when they get here, the kids, when they get here, so I take all the new kids and we do it. And then I do it with uh, the seniors to really like the second week of practice or the second week of school and like, okay, what do you want? What's your ideal? Like, give me your kind of perfect world. And then we take them and then me and my staff kind of divvy and we say like, okay, here's this or here's that. And then ultimately your level, like as Laura said earlier, like your dreams become whatever your level is. And then out of that level, like what's the best fit for us? You know, who's recruiting you the most? Like who calls you? Because I also think that there's a factor in today's world where to some extent you have to go where you're wanted and where you're able to play and, and you can have the experience that you want. And if your experience is that you want to play, like it's probably the place that makes the most sense with roster construction and coaches contract and assistant longevity and things like that. So um, it's a process. And I think that's where the, these types of schools, like the intentionality of it and this being our vocation, as opposed to just a side job that we get um, the level of expertise that we're able to not only just have, but also acquire through different scenarios. I think is, is really invaluable in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Yeah. You guys, that's all great information that I'm glad people heard you guys say, cause that's, that's how it needs to be. You know, you guys are advocates for them. You're going to help them get to the right level, the right fit. And you guys know programs they've probably never even heard of before that are perfect fits for them that are going to change their lives. So just yet another benefit of you guys being advocates. Um, John, let's start with you on this question here. Tell us what you look for in potential student athletes for your school and your program. There's 10,000 kids out there. You can pick any of them. What do you, what's your ideal Vermont Academy candidate? Wow. I I'm, I'm, I'm nervous going first. Um, you know, I, I think, I think the, uh, the, the biggest thing that, that we try to look, you know, look for is, you know, we, we want kids that want to be here. You know, we want kids that want this experience, right? all three of our schools are, are, are very different and, and they're all going to entail very different things. And I think finding kids that are good fits for what you have to offer and what you're going to ask them to do um, is really, really valuable. And I think once you lay out what the expectations are and what it's going to be like um, finding kids that want that, you know, those are usually your, your kids that have great experiences here, right? You know, those are usually the kids that, um, you know, maybe exceed your own expectations for them and, and end up doing great things and, and, you know, going on to great things. So 
that's that's you know the more i do this the, the more i'm learning that that that's a really really big piece of this is you know kids that want what you're what you're offering and and um, that's exciting to them and they're willing to kind of do whatever it takes to to make sure that that they can have a good experience how about you lamar very similar to john i, I you know i really want kids who want to be here um Another thing for me is I really want kids who want to really work and become better basketball players. Like, the, and that's super important to me. Um, you know, we, we graduate, like I said, four kids who are going to play division one this year. And when they came here, um, two, three of them as sophomores, one of them as a junior, but they came in here with no ranking, no nothing. And they've worked their tails off to be become better basketball players six o'clock in the morning workouts, um, you know, working with our strength and conditioning, coaching, getting stronger. Um, you know, I, I give them all the credit in the world because they put themselves through this to get become better basketball players and they embraced coaching while they were here too. And so um, they need to be able to one embrace coaching one want to be better, want to get better every year. Um, you know, I, my son, I'm lucky. I have my son on my team. Right. And uh, end of his freshman year, I told him to, follow this one senior around, do what he does for the whole spring. And I promise you, you'll be a better basketball player. And it's really worked out for him. You know, he saw the effort that he put in the weight room. He saw the effort, you know, in terms of getting himself into the gym on his own. And now it becomes like I, you know, my son asked me to open up the gym every single day for him, you know, and, uh, and that wasn't who he was before, but he saw what it took to become a really good basketball player. And now he knows what, uh, what he needs to do to get, to that same level so um so it's that combination of wanting to be here wanting to be coachable um and wanting to put in the effort to, to be a become a better basketball player trey uh yeah i mean i think those are all really good points i think like a place like phelps is very unique right it's 90 students it's all boys it's on a horse farm you wear a shirt tied blazer to school every day like we have seated lunch like there's a lot of things that are outside of basketball. You know, we, we, we do basketball activities for three or four hours a day. So it's a lot of basketball, right? But there's 20 other hours where you have to be at the school, right? So there's a combination of wanting what we're offering in terms of a, a school perspective, right? Eight, eight to 10 kids in your class. Uh, you're going to really get to know your faculty. The faculty really want to get to know you. And some kids don't want that. Like some kids want to be in a 20 or 30 kid classroom and that's completely fine right it's also a lot of basketball like we get up in the morning and do 6 a.m workouts you have a lifting period during school we practice from 3 45 to 5 45 basically every day right so it's a lot of basketball and some kids want that and that's what they're seeking and those are the kids that are very successful here um and some kids it turns them off and i think that's completely fine there's a lot of different options for independent schools but I think one of the most important decisions about going to one of these places is going to the one that fits you, right? Because some of because these places, a lot of them, it's like ESPN, right? You can turn on any channel and someone's going to tell you what you want to hear, right? But it's about finding which one is going to maximize your your talent level and what you can give, uh, not only to the school, but what the school can give to you as well. Absolutely. And, and let's just touch on this real quick. Being at a prep school, uh, the gym access each year boarding students have uh trey talk to me about that like because i know some families uh are like well i'm gonna go to this basketball academy and we're gonna bust 30 minutes each way or hey my high school i can't get in there because there's volleyball going on and we can't get the key to the gym can each you explain starting with you trey like the benefits of living on a campus and being able to get in the gym yeah, I mean, I joke with almost every kid that visits that the dorm that they live in or one of the dorms that they may live in to our, uh, we have two gyms on campus. To both of the gyms are, you know, it's a three minute walk. And one of them, uh, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this in public, but like it's always open, right? So the door is always unlocked. They can go in and shoot kind of whenever they want. Um, the weight room is open, you know, multiple times a day on the weekend. We have a full time strength conditioning coach that lives on campus. So just the access to improvement for the students that self-advocate is really never ending. Cause again, we don't have, there's not 300 kids here. There's not 200 kids here. There's 90 kids here. Um, so it's very, very intentional in terms of the, the students that self-advocate and that are into it. Everyone will kind of pour into you what you need. 
Lamar, what's your access like? So we have um, three gyms and five courts on campus. So there's always a place to be able to play. Um, so you're, you'll never be locked out or not have access to an opportunity to be able to play. You'll, the volleyball team might take a court, but we will have three other courts that you can use to work on and get better. So um, that access I think is, is tremendous. And, and our kids take advantage of that. Like, a, like the greatest example is what I said today, 6.15, we opened up the gym for, you know, half dozen students this morning to work out. Three o'clock this afternoon, a bunch of guys played pickup. You know, they, their access to the gym is 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 uh, readily and available for. Them. How about you, John? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll do I'll do better than uh, than Coach Morin. One of our guys timed himself from our dorm to the gym ninety seconds. You walk across a field, so. Um, and we're really fortunate that the only people that use our, our basketball gym is our team in, in our women's team. So I tell I tell kids and families all the time, you not having access to the gym will not be an excuse for why you didn't get better. Right there. We have a gun in there that they're using all the time that they, they like probably more than I do. And the best part about this place is that, you know, they're surrounded by other people like them as well. So whenever they they go into the gym, I could walk up there right now. I guarantee you that there's probably four kids in there shooting and two more lifting, right? Or or some sort of combination, vice versa. And I think that's why you come to to these places, right? It's it's the access is important, of course, and having a gym there and not having to get on a bus or walk and do all this crazy stuff. But it's also the fact that when you go to the gym, you're not by yourself, right? You're you're with a teammate who wants to get better, who wants the same things you do who wants to be, you know, prepare themselves for college and, and be a good player here as well. So, um, you know, that's, that's a huge benefit of being at our schools. Yeah. And on that walk from uh, the dorms to your gym on the left of Vermont Academy, there's a ski jump, right? Yes. And John, you can just confirm to everyone. You have to go up that ski jump to graduate. Is that correct? Or is that a rumor? You do. You do on, on a snowboard too, which makes it even a little bit more uh, dangerous. So perfect. Or just put down some betting at the bottom and you're set. But uh, here's one thing I want to mention about gym time is you have these academies out there. And I, I only hate on academies as a stereotype. I know there's some good ones out there. Um, and we're not talking about Milton Academy. We're talking about pop-up basketball academies that are popping up around America nowadays. And one of the things they do in their marketing is talk about access to the gym. Hey, you can be in a gym five hours. Hey, you can be in our gym seven. You can be in ours 12. And just something to keep track of when you're hearing all these numbers is it's quality over quantity. If you're doing a 45 minute game speed workout one on one with a coach, you're gonna be gassed at the end of that. Okay, and you've gotten a lot of good work done to where if you are in the gym for 10 hours a day, how much of that 10 hours is actually productive? How much of it is you going game speed? How much of that are you getting better? So think about quality versus quantity when you're talking to these schools, because sometimes there's an arms race of how many hours you can get in the gym. Not concerned about that quality versus quantity. Okay. Um, John, let's go to you. How important is AAU uh, to pair that along with the prep school experience? I feel like this is a trap. Um, to, exposure to, wise, to, let's talk exposure <laughs> specifically. To be honest with you, I'm a huge, huge, huge proponent of AAU, um, and I don't really understand why it gets a, a, a bad rap. Well, I, I guess I do a little bit, but I, I think it's great that there, it gives an opportunity for so many kids to play, and there's so many good coaches, there's so many good programs, and I'd say 98% of them really, really do well by by their kids and really, really want them to be successful and really do a great job in, in partnering with us and helping their recruitment. Um, I have great relationships with every single one of our guys, AAU coaches and programs, and um, they're advocates for them just like we are. Um, so I, I, I do think that it's, it, it is, um, you know, an important aspect of it. And, you know, division one coaches have a window to evaluate. And part of that window is, um, you know, non-scholastic a AAU, whatever you would call it now, grassroots basketball. So having more opportunities to play in, in front of um, coaches and, and playing against really good players and with really good players is, is always valuable. Yeah. And I'm going to piggyback on top of that and ask you something else. The scholastic period, 
that the prep schools do in the summer. Talk to me about the advantage of that. Yeah, it's it's been awesome. And um, obviously, it's it's fairly new. And, and I've been a part of it, I think, three of the four years that NEPSAC had done it. My The, the first year they did it, I was still uh, a college assistant and I attended as an assistant. Um, it's been great for our guys. And I mean, you know, the NEPSAC and, and I don't know the numbers, you know, we need Doug Scott here. He'll tell us like 900 colleges went or something like that. But it, but it probably was somewhere between three or 400. And um, but of all levels, Right. I mean, you know, John Shire is at a game and, you know, uh, a variety of division threes and the low left. So ev- there's something there for everyone. Um, so they, they've they been great. And also, you know, some other some other advantages is it gives us a time to pl- get together as a team. It gives us some time to kind of ingratiate our, our, our new players and get them to meet our our old players and, and kind of start to become part of the program. Um, so I, I think it's it's an awesome, awesome two weekends um with with a ton of benefits college wise but also for for our current programs too absolutely how about you lamar tell me about your relationship with au coaches is it important for kids to play and then you, you hold the Slask event at your gym so just tell me about the benefits of that that you've seen in the past few years as well so i i joke with people all the time i say au is a necessary evil um but kidding aside it, it actually I don't care where my kids play as long as they're playing somewhere and um, and they're playing against good competition and having good coaching and they're, they're working to get better. So, um, so it's a really good time for them to be able to work on some different things um, and bring that back in he- to here. Hopefully they're working on the right type of things. That's the biggest thing, but um, it's another venue for them to be, to gain exposure. You know, a lot of my guys, are playing on any one of the 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 couple of uh, shoe events, and they're playing in front of college coaches all the time, which I think is really important. You just talked about the the showcase that that we that happens. Um, it's it's a phenomenal thing, as John just just brought up. Like you know, the opportunity to be able to start working with your guys and uh, exploring new roles for different players and returning players and integrating new players into your team. Um, it's, it's, it's really an incredible event in that sense. And it gives you such an advantage, um, over public schools for, for a large reason. But, um, but that, that, that to me is an important part of our summer right now is, is our, I've already started to plan our summer out based on, on those two weekends that we have to be able to play with our guys. Absolutely. And Trey? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, AAU fit is very, very important, right? I think, like, to be – not, you know, not everybody can play in EYBL or whatever, you know what I mean? So it's, like, about getting where you're going to play and you're going to be able to be seen and, and the school is going to support – or the coach is going to support you and the program is going to support you. I mean, I, I I like to think that I have tremendous relationships with AAU programs. That's how we get a lot of our kids, just to be frank and, and honest with you guys. I think, like – you know, they'll call me and they'll vouch for the student and we'll take a look and we'll tell them and be honest with them. And I think literally I, right before this call, I just got off the phone with an a, a, a former AAU coach, now a high school coach, and he was telling me all about a kid that, you know, we had on campus today. Um, you know, kind of the good, bad, and ugly. So it's it's great. I think this class given has been tremendous. I think the basketball piece is, is great. We can get the new kids in and we can kind of see like, all right, you know, here's where you got to get better. Or here's where I see you fitting. But I think – What's been great for us because we have kids from all over the place is our guys actually stay for that week in between. Um, so they come on campus, we practice on the 20th, we go play. Um, we don't play in the NEPSAC event. We have our own event, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, you know, so the, the first one's at the Hunt School, we go play, we get our matchups, you know, there's coaches there, you know, as John said, there's you know, Shanine Holloway's there and Trey Witter's an assistant at Trinity was there. Like it was kind of the, the the flow of everything. We stay for that week. Maybe we practice a little bit, they'll work out, but it's more of like, you know, just the kind of starting to gel the program and we have a cookout in my house and it's great. And then we go play a player and then everybody goes home and it's kind of a, a preview for the season. Um, so I think what the, what the NCAA is doing is they're, they're trying to figure it out, but I think it's, it's beginning to work, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And Trey, back to you for this question here. Uh, What's something that a family should be looking for when researching prep schools that you see they kind of 
forget about or don't think about ahead of time? Oof, uh, that's a good question. I think it kind of goes back to fit. And I think not like I find that when, when families come on campus, the ones that are the most prepared are the ones that are not afraid to ask questions about what's important to them. Right. So like for us, uh, we have a lot of different kinds of students. We have a kid at Brown and we have kids at Chicago and multiple kids at Emory and, and all the kind of neighboring schools. And then we've had students here that have struggled to qualify, right? That if they didn't come here, they would have, they would have had to gone to junior college and done a completely different route. Right. So for us, like you can kind of make the academic piece what you want. Like if you want it to be super kind of aggressive and, and you want to try to shoot to get to Harvard or Yale, that's great. You can do that. But you kind of wouldn't know that unless you ask the questions, right? We can sit here and sell and do all this stuff. But um, I think that the families that aren't afraid to ask questions about what's important to them, they sometimes miss the boat. I think we do a great job of kind of rolling it out. Like I say this to every family that visits, like I'm not here to play gotcha. This is a very specific kind of school. Here's what we got. Here's what's important to me. Here's what's important to the school. If it's a fit for you, that's awesome. We'd love to have you. If it's not, you'll be able to find somewhere that is. Uh, thanks for sharing that. How about you, Lamar? So again, I think, like you said, the fit's, fit's important, but I also believe that, you know, the opportunity to be able to have playing time, you know, you know, I have, oddly enough, I have said no to kids who are really good basketball players because I didn't think that they would play for us. Um, and, you know, different than, um, John and Trey, we play 16 minute halves. And so, you know, there's only so many minutes you can give guys in those 32 minutes. Right. So, um, so I always tell kids like, you know, you need to go, you need to have an opportunity to be able to play where you need to be able to have an opportunity to have your successes, but you also need to be able to have failure too, which a lot of kids have. I think both are really important for you to become the player that you want to be. And so there are some years where we have, like right now, we're, you know, we could take, we graduate five kids. There's a lot of playing time for them or starters. Um, there's a lot of playing time up for grabs for, for someone. A year ago, wouldn't it be a great decision to make to come to Milton. We had a lot of positions shored up and, and it was really going to be really hard for you to get a lot of playing time. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm honest with families straight up and I tell them, you know, there might be other schools that might be a better fit for you at this point in time. So, um, so having the opportunity to be able to have your know, successes and failures to be able to play, I think is really important. Sean. Yeah. I mean, I, I think when, when I talk to prospective families, I, I think the most important thing, and this might not be answering the question, but it's just, they also have to know what they want. Right. So that's always what I'm trying to, to kind of figure out in, in the recruiting process with them is what do they actually want? What are they looking for? And they might not come out and tell you, right. But they'll usually tell you with their actions. They'll usually tell you if you're paying attention, they usually, they usually will tell them themselves. Right. And, you know, someone might say, Oh, I want to play triple a. Well, that also entails the fact that there's, you know, 12 other really good players here that you have to compete with every single day. And maybe they just want to play triple a, but they don't want to do that. So that, that kind of doesn't balance out or work or, some kids, you know, we had talked about, you know, other coaches mentioned playing time and, you know, Coach Morin has has two teams and and that's a huge benefit to some kids. Some kids want to play a, a ton of minutes, a ton of games. They don't care who it's with or who it's against. And that's that's great, too. So I just think understanding what the family actually wants and what they're looking for um, is a really, really important part of, of the process um, in, in order to help kind of match them with um with with what they're looking for yeah and i got thanks for sharing that john i got a few thoughts on that as well is that common common practice is for a trainer an au coach a high school coach a neighbor to say hey so and so went to this prep school they did great you should check it out right and families will go with that when that could you know potentially not be the right fit at all and one thing I've learned uh, from families working throughout the years doing this is that the ones that do the most due diligence usually have the less least surprises, right? They looked at the website. They've talked to the coach. They've talked to admissions. They've talked to parents of kids who are currently there, kids who have been there. And to me, I think that's valuable um, because then you're going to hear the pros and the cons from a third party, not someone actually selling the school, right? 
Um, so I think that's important, but due diligence, you know, some families uh, will pick up a basketball academy because the trainer said so and, and not know anything about it. Some people do this with prep schools as well. And if they've got money, a school will take them, right? Maybe not you three, but like, that's how it can work out there. So ask questions, talk to people that are there now, talk to people that have been there. Uh, there's no question a prep school coach is not, is going to be scared to answer. If they are scared to answer it, that's probably a sign right there. You maybe want to move on to another one, right? Because all these prep school coaches have heard every question. Playing time, can you give me to the league? Is there NIL deals? Um, blah, 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 blah. So just my two cents right there. Um, this question I ask everybody on my podcast, and you guys are future guests on it. We're going to get you on soon, but you guys can answer it now for the audience. What does it take to be a guard at the D1 level? And Lamar, I'll start with you on that. I think now um, guard play is so important and, you know, it being able to, to compete on both ends of the court, I think is really important. Um, you got to be able to guard your position, but you got to be able to knock down shots. You got to be able to score at all three levels. Um, I, I, I think guard play is super important to the game um, right now. And, you know, being able to compete really on both ends of the court, I think are are really two important factors. How about you, Trey? Um, I think two things that have stood out for our guys who have been successful at the college level at the guard spot is they have had good to great positional size. So if they're a two guard, they're a bigger two guard. If they're a point guard, they're a bigger point guard. Uh, and then the ability to shoot the ball and play off of your ability to shoot the ball to get yourself open. Um, I think those two things have been really big for kids. And then the third thing that I think I'm starting to figure out uh, and I've learned to value this year after playing coach all two times is uh, you got to have guys who kind of know how to play because there's going to be, they're going to mix coverages. They're going to switch. They're going to do this. And that that's really starts in, and I think can be bolstered by being coached by a professional coach, right? In terms of like, this is our vocation. We can teach kids kind of all of that stuff. So those are the three things I think that are really. What about you, John? Yeah, I mean, if, if anyone wants to know what a division one guard looks like, they should watch our second game against Phelps. And, and I mean, his kid is, you know, that's what a division one guard looks like. And, you know, I think I think the two biggest things that that I try to look for is, can you make shots? Right. And not like, can you stand there and catch it with your feet set and make a shot? Like, can you catch, can you make shots on the move? Can you make them off the dribble? If someone goes under a handoff or a ball screen, can you pull up and make it? Can you play off your shot? Um, you know, like big time shot making is really, really important, especially the smaller that you are, you know, you're six, five, you can, you know, potentially bring some other things to the table. But I mean, if you're six, two, six, one, six, I mean, you have to be a big time shot maker. Um, and the other thing is, is being able to go by people. Um, can you go by people like not dribble six times and create space for a pull up? Like I am going by you, I'm in the lane and then I can make plays from there. And I think those two things are just, I mean, that's just, if they can do those two things, you can probably teach them the other stuff. You can teach them how to make decisions. You can teach them how you can teach them different finishes. You can teach them all those other things, but it's really hard to teach someone to, to explode by someone. Um, you know, especially other athletic players. So those are the two things that I, I try to look for um, whenever I'm evaluating a guard. Um, can you make shots? Can you go by people? Gotcha. Uh, thanks for sharing that, gentlemen, because most of our people that reach out to us are guards and most of them want to play D1. So that's why I, I always want guards to hear this just so they know, like, it's not a surprise. Like, here's the formula. Take it and run with it, right? Um, we got a question from a member of the audience here. And Lamar, we're going to start with you on this one. Uh, what is the best advice for a still developing 17-year-old high school senior with no rankings and no offers who wants to play D1? Well, it's we've talked a little bit about this before. It's, it's, it's hopefully attending one of these type of schools where you're playing against good competition, not just every game, but every day in practice, right? Like, you know, our, our kids get better – not necessarily just because of the, the competition that we play against, but the competitions that they have every day in practice and kids pushing each other um, for sure. So being at one of these schools that has 
a bunch of really good players is going to make you into a better player for, for sure. Um, continue to work on your body because the game has become more physical at all, all five positions for sure. Um, and then, you know, both these guys just talked about shooting is, is being able to shoot the basketball. And I think there's, um, there's, there's a place for you to, to be able to play if you can knock down shots. So I think those are super important. Trey. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, in order to improve, you have to listen and in order to listen, you have to have some form of humility. Right. And I think like you're no coach is telling you to improve on something that they think is going to hurt you. Right. So I think if you're still developing, if your body's, if you're still working on your body, you got to eat really well. I think that was one thing I really learned when I got to college, like you got to eat differently. And like one summer can truly, truly change your trajectory of working on a specific skill. We've had kids do it. Like I said before, we've had plenty of kids that have come in their postcard year or they've never talked to a college coach. They've gone division one because when they come, we say like, all right, you need to be able to do these two things. If you can't do these things, I'm not talking about division one. We'll start looking at other levels or you'll, you know, it's just not going to happen. So I think, you know, just being intentional with your work, doing it every day. Like you might not be able to go to the beach. Like you might have to go get your 500 shots up. And it's just really about prioritizing what you want out of your experience. John. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think just oftentimes, you know, in basketball now, everybody wants, you know, we, we we bemoan the kids and say, you know, oh, the kids are transferring. They want this. They want instant gratification. But the coaches do, too. And, you know, they don't understand that development isn't always linear. Right. There's there's tons of guys who maybe are 17 and are going to become great players, but you wouldn't know it then. They could be 19, right? You know, everyone develops at, a, at an early rate. We've all known kids who freshman, sophomore year, they were supposed to be, you know, future pros or what people were saying. And, they, you know, they didn't pan out or develop at the rate that they should have. So I, I just think you have to understand that, that it doesn't really matter where you're starting at. It just matters, okay, what are you going to do going forward? Um, and how are you going to prepare yourself? Because there will be an opportunity that comes, right? It might not be at one of our schools. It could be at a showcase. It could be at a camp. It could be at playing for your AAU team. It could be whatever. You're going to have an opportunity. Everyone does have an opportunity. And it's, are you prepared for that opportunity when it comes? Um, you know, you can't change what happened before, but you can kind of only change what happens in, in the future. Yeah. All good advice. And I'll give my two cents on this. You know, if you're a 17 year old senior, you're, you're young, right? And so much development can happen physically and on the court within that extra summer, extra post-grad year. So you got a couple options here. One, play AAU this spring, this summer. Two, like the guy said, hit the weight room. Three, if you want an extra year, reach out to one of us about doing a potential post-grad year. We'll look at your profile, see if it makes sense. And four, if, if that doesn't make sense, you've got NAIA, JUCO, or you can hire a college placement consultant. And they do what I do, except, and they do what these coaches do, except they place you straight from high school at the right fit in college based on academics, how good you are, what you want, and then finances. So you got a lot of options there. It comes down to kind of what you want to do or your son wants to do for their path. Um, but yeah, good question right there. Guys, we're going to finish up here soon. Um, what is one last thing you want to tell people about your program um, that you think sets you apart? Make this a little bit of a pitch. Uh, for your institution and your program. And then also in that, tell people if they want to reach out to you or want to follow you on the socials, where they can find you. Trey, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, I think one thing uh, that we tell all our families is, you know, we see kids that are hardworking and are looking for an opportunity. You know, as Coach all said, we we have two teams and they, can, they both compete at a high level. They both play, you know, very, very... Um, Intense schedules. They both play 35 or 40 games, kind of depending on how they do. I coach both teams. It's a lot more of a lift for me than it is for the kids. Uh, we practice together. It really is about exposure and maximizing the kids' uh, kind of potential. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, you can email me at T-M-O-R-I-N at the Uh I'll reach out to you uh, or one of my assistants will. Thanks, Trey. Lamar? I would say, um, you know, one of the things that we, we lean on here is our program sta staples, or which are, you know, teamwork, um, you know, being disciplined, having the next play mentality, being hopefully being aggressive, hardworking. And one of the things that we try to do as coaches, try to build confidence into our players. So, um, 
you know, I think, you know, the, for the right, you know, we, I've been very clear about, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard school to get into. It's a high academic school. Um, so that's a big part of the process here at Milton is that you, if, if you have a C on your transcript, you probably shouldn't apply, you know, and so you need to, to be able to be hardworking in the classroom and hardworking on the court. Um, that combination, and oddly enough, there's a lot of those kids out there. You, uh, and so, and we've been lucky to be able to get a lot of those kids and ways to be able to reach out to me. Um, you know, my email is lamar underscore reddix at milton.edu. Um, and I will get back to you um, in a short period of time. Thanks, Lamar. John? Yeah, um, you know, we we had a family on on campus this this past weekend on on a Sunday actually, and and I toured him him and his father around, and you know, and I said to him afterwards, I said, hey, look, you know, we're we're maybe a little different than some other national programs. You know, we don't have a staff of of, of six coaches, we don't have forty kids in our gym. You know, it's kind of a an, an intimate um, program and experience here, and you know, we we have one team and. Um, you know, we're the ones that compete at, at AAA and go to all of these other events and, and play our schedules. So I think kids have to want to do that. They have to understand what what that's like and what that entails. And, um, you know, I think that there's tons of opportunities. We've had kids come here with, you know, zero recruitment, um, whether it be a younger kid, a postgrad, and, you know, they've left with scholarships and Division One and, and all that. And, um, so the opportunity is is there for them, right? And and you know if a kid wants the opportunity and they're also ready to to step up when it's presented, um, you know they'll have a great experience here. Um, you know the best way to to reach us is is our Twitter is you know at Vermont Acad Hoop. Um, that's also our Instagram. I'm not as good on Instagram as we are on Twitter. The Twitter I try to update it, you know, almost every day. And uh, my email is jzall at vermontacademy.org. Um, you know, feel free to reach out with any questions. I, I'd always be happy to help, even if maybe this school isn't a fit, you know, I, I, you know, so many other places could be a fit and, and I'm always trying to help anyone that we can. Perfect. Thank you. And John, Lamar, Trey, thanks so much for coming on this. Those of you listening live right now, those listening on the podcast, those watching this on YouTube, you've had three uh, industry giants giving you their information information tonight. So if you're looking for prep school, right, if you're trying to figure out the next step, if you want to know if it's right for you, reach out to any of us. Like I said earlier, you can find me at prepathletics.com. We do tons of podcasts, tons of education. You don't need me. You don't need one of these coaches to do this. Um, you can do it on your own. Most families do do it on their own. But if you want to make sure you're talking to the right fitting coaches, reach out to me because that's what I do for families. Um, I save a lot of time. I save a lot of heartache and I'm insurance to make sure of all the prep schools out there, you're talking to the right fitting ones. I'll put all their contact information, social media in the show notes. Thanks so much for the questions. Um, we're going to be doing this again in the future, but follow these guys in the socials, reach out to them with questions. Um, they're going to be sharing good Intel out there as well that you can learn from. And um, it's, it's great to see the prep school basketball world growing and growing each year and part of that is due to these guys um the work they're doing the players are sending the next level to including the nba and um you got good ones here but most of the prep school world are good coaches reach out to them as well so thanks so much for tuning in uh we'll do this again in the future and we'll let you know and have a good evening